So now we move on to um, session two, uh, titled Practical Application of Neuroscience Tools to Enhance the Visitor Experience in Museums. So we are now moving from um, theoretical considerations uh, to uh, practical approaches. And it's my pleasure to introduce, uh, I, I know that you already introduced yourself, but I'm pleased to uh, introduce you. Um, so Annalisa Bansi, art historian and researcher at the, uh, I will pronounce it as, with Italian pronunciation, CESPEB um, at University of Milan Bicocca. Uh, she's the author of several, several publications uh, that apply psychology and neuroscience to the museum field and the latest volume entitled uh, The Brain-Friendly Brain Museum, uh, using psychology and neuroscience to improve this visitor experience, summarizes the approach uh, using both disciplines. So over to you. Thank you. Again, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank I would like to thank uh, Riccardo Manzotti and Giulia Norgaia who organized with me this conference, Alessandro Bruni who introduced the conference, all the speakers and Ulm University. Last but not least, all of you who are attending this meeting. As I said before, my name is Annalisa Banzi. I'm an art historian and I earn a PhD in psychology applied to museum study. My interest in psychology started during the uh, uh, university period. However, I, I began to adapt uh, psychological concepts to the museum field during the PhD program. At the time, my interest was to help visitors remember what they wanted to learn. I noticed that people, especially the ones who were not familiar with the topics addressed in, the, in museums were struggling to remember this information. Therefore, I studied memory and I, um, I carried out, I designed experiments to, uh, to trigger, that can trigger priming, which is a kind of memory while watching museum objects. And this pilot study provided very promising data and my idea is to carry out more experiments in the near future in order to favor learning, uh, visitors' learning process. So, let's now refresh uh, the main objective of this conference, which can be summarized in the systematic application of the neuroscience discoveries to the, muse to the museum field in order to enhance the visitor experience and yield data which can be useful for the scientific community to better understand our brain and human behavior. Uh, I would like also to recollect the first sections of this conference. The first one has already been done, and thanks to Michael Isaac and Antonio Charaza, we have learned what neuroscience is. Now we are in the second section, which proposes some practical application of neuroscience tools uh, to improve the visitor experience. And the third section will uh, discuss potential benefits and criticism of the application of neuroscience to the museum field. And the first sections will explore how neuroscience uh, discoveries can be exploited in temporary exhibitions. So what is the current panorama? What is the state of the art? To answer these questions would require a lot of time. And I'm just, just, therefore, I'm just sharing two examples, uh, which can give you an idea. An Italian case and a US case. The Italian case uh, is, um, mm, is an experiment which has been carried out in the La Sapper Museum located in Milan. And the objective of this experiment was to assess the visitor's reaction in front of the masterpiece painted by Leonardo da Vinci. The neuroscience tools used in these experiments were the eye tracker, the heart rate 
um, watch, um, uh, the heart rate tracker watch, and a wearable EEG. 38 participants were involved in this, uh, in this experiment. Uh, these participants were from different countries and some of them were experts and others were non-experts. Uh, TSW is the company uh, which carried out this experiment. Uh, please launch a video. As I said, the second example is a US case, and it is the Peabody Access Museum, also known as PAM. This museum works with the, the Nielsen Neuroscience Group and uses biometric uh, technologies in order to uh, understand how visitors experience museums. Its aim is also to uh, provide new curatorial approaches uh, that can be applied in PAM. Let's now talk about research in museums. And the first idea that I would like to share with you is that neuroscience does not have all the answers to our questions. However, we can take advantage of the numerous findings collected up to now. And it is a key service that museums can provide to society because they offer a meaningful experience which can encourage visitor cognitive and emotional growth. It is a new way of measuring the value of museum beyond the number of tickets sold. So what can we explore when carrying out experiments? For example, we can identify the factors that influence visual attention or the impact of museum stimuli on our behavior. And if a museum cannot afford the cost of biometric technology, it can apply for help from university resources. And this is just one of the reasons why it would be useful to start this permanent collaboration. The collection of data in museum in the museum setting can be of interest also for neuroscientists because it tells these data these results can help to understand to better understand how our brain works as the museum is not a it, as a museum is a natural complex uh, setting uh, which is totally different from a lab, of course we can have bias. 
And for example, uh, we can have bias such as uh, the fact that the museum is not a fully controlled context or there can be difficulties in the replication of an experiment. Now I would like to introduce the, the brain-friendly museum book, also known as the BFM. This is the index of the book and the volume is composed of 13 chapters. The first eight, eight chapters focus on emotions, cognitive processes and well-being. Chapter 9 to 13 uh, presents uh, uh, methods, ideas, projects of researchers and practitioners who exploited neuroscience in the museum context, in the museum setting. Sorry. The last session introduced the ASBA project, which I will talk about in a moment. What is a brain-friendly museum? This is the whole definition, the complete definition. In sum, a BFM combines the traditional tasks of a museum with the respect of the needs of our brain. And I would like to stress the needs of our, the respect of the needs of our brain. Because I believe it is a fundamental con con condition for a greater appreciation by visitors of our heritage. The BFM approach is mainly based on the neuroscience discovery and tools and the long lasting, uh, long tasted sorry, uh, techniques and methods developed by psychology, especially cognitive psychology, cogn the cognitive branch. And I believe that uh, whole comprehension, awareness and consideration of the cognitive process and emotion in the museum setting can offer a meaningful experience. Of course, we can take advantage of the data introduced in the scientific, in the scientific, scientific papers. However, the book proposes some experiments to be carried out in museums in order to obtain more results which can be useful for museums. And the BFM approach encourages the systematic collaboration across domains between museum experts, psychologists, neuroscientists, engineers, and so forth. And as the first argument addressed in the book is the motion, therefore the first uh, uh, experiment which we are carrying out is uh, focused on this topic. And the project is called ASBA. ASBA stands for Anxiety, Stress, Brain-Friendly Museum Approach. And it aims to reduce levels of anxiety and stress in order to enhance overall mental well-being in adults, museum staff, and young people. This means that the study is composed of three separate steps. ASBA is uh, adapting and assessing several methods uh, such as mindfulness and art therapy to improve, to enhance uh, mental well-being, but also to promote museum collections. And the ASBA team is uh, made up of uh, art historians, psychologists, neuroscientists, engineers and practitioners who are expert in the selected methods. The ASBA, um, if you want more information, uh, you can uh, visit the website. And I would also like to, um, to share another, another idea with you, it, is that another information, is that the, the, the ASBA project has been approved by the Research Ethic, Ethics Committee of the Bicocca University. So, thank you very much for your attention. If you want to get in touch with me, you can write me an email. This is my email address. And I hope this is the first of many initiatives dedicated to promote the application of neuroscience to the museum field. Thank you very much. Thank you, Annalisa.
Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. I would like to ask you lots and lots of questions, but we are uh, a bit tied up with the, you know, the, the, the time and uh, you know, the scheduled um, speeches uh, by our scheduled speakers. So I will move on to um, the next presentation by Vincenza Ferrara, uh, Scientific Manager and Coordinator of Visual Thinking Strategies Italia. Uh, an art historian, um, had, uh, former head of the Art and Medical Humanities Laboratory at the Far Faculty of Pharmacy and Medicine. Okay, so over to you. Thank you very much for being here. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation to this uh, uh, conference. Um, also, yeah, I am a professor of uh, special uh, pedagogy in uh, nursing course uh, at Sapienza University. That's great, thank you. That I did. is uh, uh, important uh, because uh, is uh, 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 connected with uh, our uh, uh, conversation. Uh, okay. Um, I uh, try to talk in a few minutes about a, a project, a Neuro Artifact. A Neuro Artifact project is a project in collaboration with Duke University. Maurizio Forte defined a Neuro Archaeologist <laughs> um, Sapienza University with me and Marco Iosa, a psychologist famous for Michelangelo effect in uh, patient uh, in rehabilitation. Um, and uh, Etruscan Museum, a very important uh, uh, partner, and uh, um, Startup of Sapienza in uh, um, technology uh, of application in neuroscience. Uh, this project uh, um, uh, have the, um, uh, wanted to, to investigate the impact of museum objects, uh, starting with archaeological ones, uh, uh, in this case uh, uh, of Etruscan Museum, on people in terms of uh, emotional involvement, well-being, learning, cognitive de development, uh, using uh, qualitative analysis and technological tools, uh, a technological tools, uh, uh, eye tracking, EEG, and other uh, important to um, uh, evaluate the impact of the perception of museum object in the museum in front of the particular artifact or in virtual space. The same object, so we uh, can evaluate uh, eventually differences of perception and reaction of the visitor in the museum or participate and experience in uh, virtual space. Um, the first objective uh, was to understand how the perception and the reaction of the neural and emotional areas to the vision archaeological tools for the detection of biometric and neurophysiological data, uh, knowledge, and competence activity. Uh, different uh, were the aims and the objectives, and different are now also. Understanding how the best show the object uh, and what addition in terms of activities, for example, and device useful for a visitor involvement and understanding of the object and its consent. We studied that uh, the people um, in uh, many, many cases not uh, remember the object that uh, uh, the, the visitor um, so, because uh, so and not look at, at uh, uh, and so, um, is very important to understand if uh, um, 
there are other, for example, uh, deposition, for example, but also other activities to involve and engage the visitors. How the museum object can be useful for learning, for example, not only to well-being, but only for learning, because learning is very important also for limiting stress. The WHO in the 1992 um, indicate uh, is very important uh, in the school, but uh, in all uh, learning environment, in, um, uh, use especially uh, activity to improve competence. Cognitive, emotional, and relational comp competence because uh, this action uh, permit uh, to have the better quality of life and limiting stress. So, the, uh, it's very important for, for uh, our group to, to know this uh, opportunity. How the museum object can be used <laughs> for well-being and how the museum object can be used for cognitive development and rehabilitation in patients with health problems. Um, we applied the eye tracking, EEG and other technology but also two questionnaires based on assessment uh, uh, by neuroscientist strategy and uh, other questions uh, how evaluate the influence of art expertise and training on emotion and preference. Uh, um, uh, it's very important uh, uh, for me to have uh, um, uh, the opportunity to study this uh, for example, study of Chatterjee, because uh, uh, I discovered how is uh, um, important, or uh, better, uh, how the difference of age, gender, uh, studies, experience, uh, culture can be influenced the uh, understanding of uh, images of work of art, for example, and can uh, um, uh, facilitate the well-being because for uh, people is important that the, the same object uh, can be um, uh, suggest different emotion in, in depend on their uh, experience uh, and uh, competences. This is the question. Uh, uh, are there uh, any difference in the experience at the museum and the in augmented reality? Are there any difference between uh, those who participate first in the experience uh, and the museum and the augmented reality? Uh, because uh, we compare uh, the same object before in the museum and uh, after in the uh, virtual space and uh, in opposite uh, case. Are there any difference in experience if pedagogical methods and cognitive psychology are adopted to activate the involvement of the participant? For example, we adopted the visual thinking strategies method in uh, some uh, visitor and uh, we can uh, go to refer the results. The visual tiki strategies uh, were born in the United States. Uh, is uh, the method from the OSEN, psychology cognitivist, and uh, Philip Wine, head of uh, um, MoMA Museum in activity, didactic activities. Uh, since to, um, 2014, uh, I build this research group and uh, uh, I apply this method in different sectors, 
also in nursing and medicine student, for example, to improve uh, comp competencies. And uh, um, we have uh, the uh, good results, for example, um, this is the results of a qualitative results uh, for the Neuroactive Act project. And um, uh, we can see the better response of familiarity of work art for students of high school and faculty of medicine. We had uh, uh, students or historian of art, uh, mathematics, uh, engineering, uh, and uh, our um, uh, idea, uh, these results uh, can be a relation, uh, the visual thinking strategies, because uh, this uh, group uh, participated previously uh, to the, this vision at the VTS session. We have other uh, results that indicate uh, the um, uh, reaction and uh, create of comfort area to uh, observe, in this case, uh, the uh, object. Uh, I report the, um, we, uh, with uh, Maurizio Forte and Duke University continuing this experiment in, not in the museum, but, but in uh, archaeological excavation. And uh, um, this is the experience, uh, the results, uh, the evaluation of uh, uh, Maurizio Forte. And uh, we, can, uh, we can see in... Uh, um, Left, on the left uh, is the uh, movement of, of ocular of uh, non not archaeologist visitors, and the other side archaeologist visitors. Um, why the difference? Because uh, the visitors uh, uh, have curiosity and don't, don't know the uh, archaeologist excavation, so move uh, in different uh, and uh, um, in different uh, position. In the, the other side, the archaeologist um, know the, uh, the excavation, so not um, um, not see in that mode. Uh, and uh, we, in fact, not archaeologist, archaeologist is uh, the representation of the eye, track, eye, eye tracking. Um, okay. Uh, other uh, a suggestion, uh, we uh, um, uh, comparison with um, archaeologists EEG and not archaeologists EEG. We um, uh, see the difference and uh, non-archaeologists have more excitation to see uh, a, a excavation, for example. Uh, this is a suggestion of uh, AI, uh, Maurizio Forte, and Etruscan landscape to, um, from the data. Uh, in this case, uh, a test, uh, a video of Vulci landscape, maybe in the first and second century. Uh, we have other, um, in this time, we have other projects and other results. And uh, uh, if uh, uh, you would like to know other results, uh, that is my mail. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Ferrara. I could also see some glimpses of uh, uh, 
empower AI empowered solutions over there with AI generative uh, generative AI examples. So thank you again for being here and thank you for your presentation. Um, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to run a question and answer uh, session, so we need to um, carry on with the next uh, um, speaker, uh, Seda Pezen. I don't know if my pronunciation is correct. Uh, so Seda, can you hear us? Yes, so I can Seda hear you very Pezen well. Seda Pezen is a researcher and published author. Uh, she studied art history and comparative literature at um, my, pronunci my pronunciation uh, will not be good enough. I will let you pronounce uh, it's Ranish Friedrich Willems, University of Bonn. Have I pronounced it correctly? Yes. Okay, thank you. So you continue to do your studies in master's program, critical and curatorial studies at Stadermann. Okay, so uh, thank you for uh, being here. Um, over to you for your presentation. Thank you very much for the super kind introduction. I'm just going to share my screen so that you can all see my presentation. Um, can you see it? Yeah, we, we see uh, the PowerPoint uh, clients from your computer, but that's, that's visible. We can keep going with it. Okay, great. Does it not show in presentation mode or? Uh, well, I guess that should be fair enough. Yeah. Up to you if you want to switch uh, to the full screen. Yeah, I'm trying to and somehow it doesn't properly work. Well, I will try again and then let's see. Somehow it doesn't work. I suppose that it's a, it's a common problem that we have when we switch mm -hmm. from uh, two different screens. So you may have the full screen on your laptop and uh, the client, in this case, PowerPoint side okay. in our screen. So okay. you should, but that, that's, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Okay. I think it will, it will work from this. If you cannot see something sufficiently, maybe you just tell me. Sure. So thank you very much again for the invitation, Annalisa Bansi, and the very kind introduction. My name is Seda Pesen. I'm a part of the Lab for Cognitive Research and Art History at the Department of Art History at the University of Vienna. And my presentation today is um, dealing with the question how we can engage with mobile eye tracking as a method to explore gaze behavior in the museum. And mobile eye tracking should be known to you by now since you've heard it a couple of times in the other presentations. I want to start with a very brief introduction into mobile eye tracking in general, just to refresh your understanding of it, then come to a brief overview on the development of the application in the field of museology, and then end with some insights on current projects of our lab. And most of you know this video, I think, or something similar. This video shows a study where participants were asked to count the passes that were made within uh, the team with white t-shirts. You can see in this video one participant um, looking at or counting the people in the white shirt, but not noticing the white, uh, the bear dancing and passing through the group. What half of participants didn't actually see. And this experiment shows us two things. First, the limitations of perception are to be more precise of visual awareness and attention. And second, and those that goes with this, is that the gaze is a composition of uh, different eye movements, mainly fixations, the longer gazes, and saccades, the jumps in between. Visual arts requires, as the terminology um, already suggests, a very specific form of looking and visual attention. So it stands to reason that there's, of course, a big interest uh, to study the gaze quantitatively, since that has already been done in art history for decades qualitatively and in theory. 
I'm now coming to the brief overview I promised you in the beginning on uh, the application of mobile eye tracking and museum studies. So uh, the first studies were conducted in laboratory settings dating back to the 20th century and to the early 2000s. The conditions in the lab are of course more comparable because of the study conditions than in the museum. And now see here, which is also one of the main reasons for these early studies. On the other hand, it's quite clear for all of us who are working in the museum that factors like the size of an artwork or the materiality of it just get lost in uh, lab settings, but also the emotional setting and the complementation mode that we meet artworks with. I've now um, put together three studies um, to uh, help us gain an understanding of the application and the development of the method in the context of museum studies. The first attempts to record gaze behavior in museums have been realized on from the 2010s. Mobile eye tracking in museum studies is therefore a still fairly recent phenomenon. The goal um, is or was in these very early studies to explore the potentials but also difficulties of mobile eye tracking. As you will see, all of the studies that I'm showing going to show are limited in their conditions. Due to technical challenges, I'm oh, sorry. Due to technical challenges, the very first eye tracking studies and exhibitions were often designed similar to an experimental setup in the lab. As we can see in this image, which shows the study by Bach et al, which was conducted in 2012, and which studied the perception of only one single artwork in the restrained conditions, as we can see. The study was also restrained, not only because of this lab-like setting, but also because of the quite small number of participants and the fact that this wasn't a real museum with regular museum visitors, but with staff members acting as participants in the study. They had to sit in front of this very particular painting by Edward Hopper, weren't able to move and were only allowed to look, as I've already said, at this one uh, painting. Unfortunately, the data quality of this study and the recorded case data was so insufficient that the researchers didn't gain too much insight, but were able to make recommendations for other technical setups. Another study by uh, Kiroga et al. also conducted an eye tracking study with only one uh, painting, but this time with six participants, so even less but in a moving situation. So the participants were able to move through the room while looking at the painting and were able to uh, experience the painting in more dimensions than just from one distance. Uh, they also did what I found interesting, a comparison um, with a lab study showing the painting of Ophelia uh, as a digital reproduction on a computer screen. Even though the sample was smaller than in Bachter's study, the data quality was sufficiently better. They came to the result that museum visitors look at paintings more thoroughly and in more detail. This rather experimental setup of these pioneering studies, which is not always in line with the natural conditions of an exhibition visit, is still partly found in later MET studies. This study by um, Briba et al. conducted a comparative study on the differences between viewing at art in the lab using reproductions, so just as Kiroga, um, and in the museum in front of originals. But now the participants were able to finally move through one whole exhibition and not only look at a separated artwork. Riba and I still gave their participants a very specific order to look at uh, the artworks and to go through the exhibition, but other than that, the participants were free. The results have shown that the museum participants liked the artworks more, found them more interesting and looked at them longer than the participants in the laboratory. So all of these very young and pioneering studies have shown us that uh, the museum experience is a quite different experience 
than the artificial lab study. Looking back now at the state of arts from the um, more earlier um, MET studies, we can look at the limitations and characterize them as following. They all have a standardized restricted setting with only a few pre-chosen artworks, a static uh, viewing or pre-chosen viewing settings, quite low number of participants and inaccurate gaze data. I'm now coming to the studies from a lab for cognitive research and art history that are tackling those limitations. The study Baby Debbie Porn After that was conducted in 2018 and 2019 was a project of um, the CREA lab, our lab, with the Department of Computer Science at the University of Tübingen in Germany, the EPA lab at the Department of Psychology at the University of Vienna and the Austrian Gallery Belvedere. The Belvedere had a major rearrangement in 2018 and 2019 in the Upper Belvedere and that offered us a very unique opportunity to study the viewing behavior of the same artworks on different conditions. The rearrangement uh, consisted of three major changes. One we can see here. First, the old display um, used a variety of colors here, for example, black. And the new ones relied only on uniformly white walls. Second, the art historical narration in the single exhibition rooms has changed drastically, coming to a more fresh and um, contemporary approach on how to tell Austrian art history. And third, one of the most major changes was that in the setting before on this side, the artworks didn't have any interpretative or introductory label texts to them. Um, and in the rearrangement, they all got a new label. So text information on the background of the painting, um, why and how it came together, etc. The interdisciplinary team of researchers that we gathered um, joined forces to analyze the question, how does the gaze uh, influence or how the, how, sorry, how does the display influence the way people see and experience art in a museum? The study was um, accordingly conducted in two parts, one before and one after the arrangement with different participants. And the researchers, just to come now to the procedure, uh, recruited natural visitors as their participants. So they could uh, walk and move freely to the exhibition with mobile eye tracking glasses on. And after the tour, the participants filled out a questionnaire and took part in a mapping session about their exhibition experience. Coming to the results, I want to show you this graph and I hope you can see it properly. Um, that showcases, so this graph showcases all of the 13 artworks that were looked at in both settings. It shows the average viewing time of artworks and labels in seconds, comparing both weeks, as you can see in this legend above. The results show that through the rearrangement of the exhibition, the viewing time of artworks increased in general, the reading time of labels increased in general, and that the visitors, we cannot see it in this graph, but through the surveys and mappings, we found out that visitors had to deeper engagement with all of the artworks in total. One very striking result that you can sense here already when looking at, for example, the Kiss by Gustav Klimt or and the sculpture of the Nymph, that uh, a major difference is the viewing time of paintings and sculptures and how much they differ. Sculptures were looked at uh, for as a mean 16 or 17 seconds and sculptures only for six seconds. So it was quite striking that sculptures tend to be overseen in exhibitions. The fact that we could only analyze 100 participants out of the 200 participant, 250 participants that we gather highlights also the fact that we still need a very sophisticated technical advances in the field of mobile eye tracking. 
The results of the um, the results of the study opened the path to dive deeper into the different issues um, present. Our newest project, the Museum Gaze, aims to answer those. The project is a joint project with computer scientists now from the Technical University of Munich and again the Austrian Gallery Belvedere. Coming from the BBA study that I've presented to you earlier and now looking at the state of art that I've also presented, our goals are to first study the so-called relational gaze, that means the relation between text and image, how, for example, different styles of uh, text influence our viewing behavior. Then secondly, to study the medium-specific gaze, that means the fact that I've already mentioned, the reason why paintings and sculptures differ so much in viewing time and are looked at so differently. And third, to build a new software to enable easier and faster analysis so MIT could potentially also be used by museum professionals. Since the Belvedere is um, a new project partner and not only like a helping institution, we have the very great opportunity to again work in a comparative manner like in the pilot study. But this time we as researchers um, are designing the changes in the exhibition in close contact with the curators. So we can design all of the changes and rearrangements very closely tailored to our research questions and aims that we have. And this time we are also not only limited to uh, one epoch, but we are going through all of the different collection departments that the museum has. I want to end my presentation with a little insight video on eye tracking and thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to have a discussion later. So thank you very much for your interesting presentation. We all appreciated your uh, the description of your real case scenario. Uh, again, unfortunately, we haven't we have not enough time to run question answer session. So uh, thank you again. Uh, let's uh, give uh, set a round of applause to thank you for your presentation again. And uh, um, we now welcome. Uh, Michael, you will excuse me for mispronouncing your surname. I'm pretty sure that I will mispronounce it, but I will give it a try. Michael Tanqui. Very close. Everybody mispronounces it, so, uh, okay, you're, so you're I'm in excused good company. now. <laughs> thank yes, you. Exactly. So, Michael, thank you for for being here. Michael uh, is a senior lecturer in art history at the University of Essex. Uh, where he began working in 2015, um, and uh, he followed a postdoctoral fellowship at the um, um, Planck Institute. Um, okay, so he received his doctorate at, and MBA from the University of Chicago. So very interesting journey, Michael. Thank you for, for being here. Uh, we are pleased to have you here for today's uh, conference. Over to you. Thank you, um, and I should also mention I will be uh, jointly presenting with my colleague Ian Daly, who is a senior lecturer in um, computer science at the University of Essex with me. Um, and Ian, I believe you're going to be sharing the presentation while I start. Yes, that's right. Just bear with me for a second. And while he's doing uh, that, I should just uh, thank Annalisa Vancey and all her colleagues for the invitation to uh, come speak and for the opportunity to learn all of the exciting research from uh, those who have uh, presented before and those who will present after. Okay, so um, we're going to be uh, speaking today about some results uh, from a, an experiment that we put together of a project that Ian led and I was a co-investigator on. Uh, Ian, if you can go to the next side, uh, slide, please. Um, as many of us know far too well through the temporary closure of museums during the pandemic, Virtual exhibits provide a way to connect with audiences who may not otherwise be able to visit a museum and experience its objects in person. And when I speak of virtual exhibits, I refer partly to online exhibits that faithfully mimic 
the features of a museum's physical galleries, say in the form of virtual guided tours that the British Museum offers. And this is uh, an example of that. But I also use the term virtual exhibit more broadly to describe any online exhibit of objects, including those that display objects in isolation, say through 3D scans of artworks or artifacts placed against a black background. Uh, and Ian, I think there might be another slide here, but I'm not sure. So based, oh, sorry, no, I'm wrong. Um, based on research about spectators' experiences, okay, um, while virtual exhibitions have certainly exploded in recent years, both in terms of their sheer volume and complexity, one issue that remains less than fully explored by scholars and museum professionals alike is the role that sound may play in spectators' experiences. For instance, how do different types of soundscapes shape the amount of time viewing or otherwise engaging with objects in a virtual exhibit? And how do they shape one's emotional response to exhibited objects or the willingness to learn more about the objects on display? Based on research or uh, research about spectators' experiences in actual or in real life exhibition spaces, sound often has a decisive effect on these experiences. This may occur, for example, by using sound to create more individually tailored experiences or by provoking personal memories associated with the artworks or artifacts on display, as various scholars have shown. However, significant differences exist in how spectators perceive objects in virtual and physical exhibits. This is evidence, say, in how one may virtually turn objects around or zoom in and out when viewing objects online, or in how one does not need to physically move one's body to view a sequence of objects in a virtual exhibit. Given such differences, our research team conducted an experiment with roughly 100 participants that explored how four different soundscapes shaped a spectator's responses to objects virtually exhibited. To clarify our use of the term soundscape, we refer here broadly to, quote, acoustic environments whose character is the result of action and interaction of natural and or human factors, end quote. Our initial hypothesis guiding these experiments was that pairing soundscapes with objects in a virtual exhibit would enhance audience engagement. At the same time, based on our assumption that soundscapes would likely have different effects on spectator engagement, we wanted to use the experiment to better understand such differences. In what follows, my colleague Ian and I will prevent, uh, present an overview of the experiment, followed by some key findings and a discussion of the project's broader implications. The crux of our findings, should anyone wish to cut to the punchline, is that certain soundscapes did have stronger effects on participants, but crucially, in more complex ways than we anticipated, which stemmed from how audiences sought to make connections between the objects they saw and the soundscapes they heard. And Ian, I hand the virtual microphone over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. Um, can you all hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, thank excellent. You. Thank you. Okay, so yes, th thank you, Michael, for the introduction. Um, I'd just first highlight we worked with um, a number of colleagues on, on this work, so it's not just me and Michael. We also worked with a sound engineer, uh, Duncan Williams at the University of Salford, um, archaeologist, uh, Dr. Paola Di Giuspenti, so Pantinio Di Franco, I'm butchering the name, I apologize to all of the Italians in the room, um, and our research assistant, Ines LT. Um, let's see if I can move to the next slide. Okay, so I'll briefly state that our original plan um, when we began this project was to also look at physiological and neurological um, correlates of responses to the pairing of soundscapes and museum objects. Um, Unfortunately, of course, COVID came along and derailed that particular part of the experimental plan. Um, so the research and the results we're going to present today focus largely on the survey base, the behavioural responses to the pairings of objects and soundscapes. Um, right, so we selected a subset 
of um, 3D scans of objects from the British Museum website, um, intended essentially to give us a broad um, selection of different types of objects from different um, locations in the world, different eras, um, in order to give us a, a broader groupings of objects as we could. Um, we presented these objects to our 100 or so participants in an online experiment um, for 30 seconds at a time and we paired the objects with a set of four different types of soundscape. Um, so we worked closely with our colleague uh, Dr Williams to design these types of soundscape in order to attempt to explore how different soundscapes paired with objects affects the way that our participants report engagement with those objects. Um, I'll briefly go through what the, the, the soundscapes are and I'll play examples of each of them as we go. So the first type of soundscape is what we call a real museum soundscape, um, which is essentially adapted from the BBC sound effect library and sounds much like the sort of, sort of typical soundscape you would expect to hear within a real museum setting. Um, so let me try and play this and let me know if you can hear it. Yes, we can hear it. Thank you. OK, excellent. OK, so we don't need to play very much of that soundscape for you to get the idea. It's essentially the background chatter and footsteps that you hear within a typical busy museum setting. Um, our next soundscape was based on the Foley um, sound effect um, idea where the soundscape was designed around each individual object. So, for example, with the object of a water gourd, we have the sound of falling water. Um, they were carefully edited in order to be in some way evocative of the object. The synthesized object, uh, sorry, the synthesized soundscape, on the other hand, was based upon um, the sound design tradition, approximately in the tradition of Brian Eno. Um, so it's a generative soundscape produced by an algorithm um, that produces ambient sound that is in some way intended to be engaging with the objects on display. Okay, and our final soundscape category was based on uh, effective sound, so a composition of effective sounds um, from the IADS effective sound database. Okay, I think I need to skip through soundscapes. I was not expecting that to happen. Okay, so um, after we present our objects and played our soundscapes, we asked participants to report their uh, current level of engagement and effect with each of the objects and the soundscapes. And we also asked them to present, uh, describe their responses to the soundscapes in an open-ended question. Um, we had an additional trial type where we also presented pedagogical information about the soundscapes and we asked sorry, pedagogical information about the objects, and we asked participants whether they wanted to learn more about the objects. So we investigated whether pairing particular soundscapes with particular objects encouraged participants to learn more about each of the objects. Um, we performed three types of analysis on our results. Um, we firstly used a multi-layered linear regression model to identify relationships between pairings of soundscape uh, object and engagement as reported by participants. Um, we then use post hoc t-tests to find out which particular pairings of objects and soundscapes and which particular pairs of soundscapes were significantly different from one another. Um, and finally, we use inductive reasoning with our qualitative responses, our free text responses, to tease out particular uh, patterns and results from our pairs of uh, objects and soundscapes. 
Uh, this is just a quick example of some of the engagement questions we asked our participants. I'll skip on to the results because I'm conscious of the time. Um, essentially, our headline results are that our object-based soundscapes and our synthesized soundscapes were more engaging for participants on average and statistically significantly more engaging than our than either using just silence or real museum soundscapes, so ambient background noise from a museum environment, or our IEDS based soundscape. Uh, we found this result was consistent across each of our engagement questions. Um, we also ran a principal component analysis on our engagement questions and we repeated the analysis on the first principal component, which correlates with engagement, and we found that this result repeats again. Um, we also found, quite interestingly, that the more engaged participants were with soundscapes, uh, with the objects, the more likely they were to request additional information about the object. Um, I will jump on to the last summary slide because I'm conscious of the time as well. Um, from our quantitative data, we found that participants found that the object-based and synthesized soundscapes were the most engaging. Um, we also found that varying the soundscape can increase engagement for participants if they don't find the object particularly interesting, but that there wasn't a particularly large effect when participants already found the object quite engaging. Um, however, from our qualitative data, we did find that engagement wasn't always desirable for all of our participants. One particularly surprising result we found was that a number of our participants reported that, for example, the synthesized, synthesized soundscape um, was described as unsettling, creepy or disturbing, whereas the IADS based soundscape was described as annoying or disruptive. Um, so I, I think I'm going to leave Michael to jump onto the big takeaway messages, but one of the little takeaway messages is that while varying the soundscape will vary the amount of engagement, we need to be careful that that engagement is optimal and that the soundscape that we pair our object with is optimal for the right sort of engagement. Okay, and back to you, Michael. Okay, thank you. Um, in final remarks, just wanted to very briefly sketch some of the broader implications of our findings. In short, what do we really learn from this data and what future areas of study does this study uh, think, uh, suggest might be fruitful? So to begin, I must stress that the experiment con constituted a very modest first step in uh, better understanding how sound may shape a spectator's experience of virtual exhibits. Um, you know, obviously each object was displayed in a very simple manner. So one uh, thing follow on studies must do is account for how sound affects a spectator's experience in different modes of display, uh, particularly for longer sequences of objects in um, uh, perhaps varied built environments. Additionally, even if the pandemic required us to shift from a lab-based experiment to one conducted online, our research team very much wants to record physiological data, um, which was something clearly that uh, we could not do with all of the self-reporting that participants uh, did, as they may not have been aware or fully aware of their own body's responses to what they were um, experiencing. That all said, the first experiment does point to some potentially interesting ways that sound may be harnessed more fully when virtually exhibiting objects. Uh, for instance, one basic takeaway is that sound may generate higher engagement levels among um, visitors to virtual exhibits. At the same time, um, it was striking that synthesized scans, soundscapes were considered among the two types that generated the highest engagement levels. Um, and this finding, which chimes with the so-called Foley effect, suggests that creative sound design might offer among the most promising avenues for integrating sounds into virtual exhibits. Um, and 
you know, last but not least, based on our findings, we were cautiously optimistic that participants often uh, thought critically about the relationship between the sounds they heard and the objects they saw, for instance, when trying to decode the link between the two. However, in future iterations of the study or others, um, it would be productive to better understand how sound might play a role in stimulating critical thought, be it about the meaning of an object, its use value, the social political context in which it was produced, or about how the object found its way into or perhaps out of a museum's collection. Needless to say, these and other issues will confront us as we embark on developing new ways and more nuanced ways to uh, think about how sound may be used in exhibits, both virtual and physical. Nevertheless, one thing does remain certain. If we wish to use sound in exhibitions, it's crucial to question well-worn assumptions about spectator behavior, to better measure and analyze how spectators respond, and ultimately to organize our research and applied use of sounds in ways that advance critical thought. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are grateful for your presentation. And personally, I want to thank you for uh, providing us with uh, um, you know, intersections between several uh, disciplines and I really appreciate the way you uh, showed us uh, soundscapes and uh, insights into the topic. Okay, so we are now going to have a break, uh, but before having a break, I invite the whole audience to give a round of applause to all our speakers. Thank you very much. Okay, so we will resume our um, our session, the session after a quick break. So, uh, 4:30 p.m. sharp. <laughs>